include this uh, uh, sermon that I started a couple of weeks ago. Next week, uh, Daryl Parker will be with us. He comes out, he's gonna house it for his brother. So he and Kim are gonna be in town. And so Daryl's always, uh, you know, on 4th of July, we need some fireworks, and Daryl always has a little fireworks with him when he comes. He's so full of life, I don't know where he gets his energy at. Maybe I better try to find out what violence old Daryl takes, I'll tell you. All right, we're gonna get, we're gonna get the green free. We're, we're waiting for the Milwaukee Bucks. We're gonna, I don't know how we're gonna maybe win from them, but uh, we gotta get rid of these Clippers first, you know. Uh, uh, that's about the only sin I have, is uh, as a Suns fan, but uh, you know, I'm just really proud of these guys. This, this coach is a wonderful Christian and uh, lost his wife several years ago. It was just a heartbreak throughout the NBA. And this man is well thought of. He's really a classic guy. And uh, I know one time they had a horrible game and heard him on national television. They were interviewing one of the players and said, I bet your coach was cussing you guys this week. He said, no, our coach don't cuss. And uh, he has a great testimony. His son, uh, 11-year-old son, I understand, had a malignancy removed from his chest recently. And then this uh, guy, DeAndre Ayton, who was doing such a great job, probably our outstanding player in the center. He's from the Bahamas. And uh, he played high school here. Then he played a year down at U of A. And so Mike had played against him when we were playing club basketball. And so, you know, I'm just kind of connected with some of these guys. And I just love to see him doing so good. And I think it's good for our valley. We've been so separated and isolated. And you know, that's really damaging. And, uh, it, <laughs> you know, we're saying that the cure for this uh, pandemic might be worse than the disease itself. And this isolation is just horrible. And trying to get us back together again and seeing 18,000 people in the arena has just been exciting and just been so renewing and refreshing. And uh, if we can keep politics out of these sporting events, they have a great way of uniting us and healing a lot of the things that have separated us. And so. You know, I'm really enjoying it, so I hope that I'm not boring you with this. John chapter 13, I'll hurry through this. I want to go through these events. And uh, we're talking about dinner in Father's house. It really is not probably a very good title. This is the Last Supper. It's uh, kind of dinner with Jesus, with his disciples. I wonder if you can just make yourself feel the tension and the emotions of sitting there that night when you knew Jesus was getting ready to leave you, and you knew that you're getting ready for some difficult times, and the Lord has kind of been preparing them, and here we are, and we start, and we're gonna read these uh, first seven verses, and uh, I'm going to read them out of my Bible. I'll read them off the screen. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew, that was one of the things, if you have a Bible you can mark in, he knew, I would circle that, Mark that in my Bible in a bright yellow because he knew. He knew what was ahead of him. He knew sitting right there were guys who were going to betray him. He knew right there was a guy that was going to curse and just swear he never knew him. He knew all of this. And I'm so glad he knows today. He knows all of my needs. He knows your needs. He knows what we're going through. He was there with Linda when she went through all of these situations. He's there with you. He knows when you go to pray, he knows. Don't get so carried away and caught up in all of these books and tapes about how to pray. The Lord knows you. Get full of the Holy Spirit. He prays through us with intercession. I've got some kind of echo in the back. And uh, he's, uh, he knows what we have need of before we ask. And he knows how to say it when we don't know how to say it. And when the Holy Spirit prays through us, he prays in the perfect will of God. So, you know, sometimes we, and I think this is one of the problems with the church, and I think, uh, you know, we say we're dying by degrees. I think sometimes we get so smart and too smart for our own good, we get caught up in all of these technicalities 
And I think that's when you get into religion. I'm more into relationship. I have three sons. They all have different relationships with me. All of you have different relationships. You know, I've talked about, you know, somebody has their marriage healed and write a book on how to heal your marriage. And it's the worst thing you can do is to copy them. Because, you know, I'm not married to their wife and they're not married to Betty. And I use the example, you heard me say this before, you know, about hold her gently and run your hands through her hair. I'm going to get my face slapped if I touch <laughs> their chair, you know. And uh, I was scared about how I like to run my fingers through her hair, so she said, get you a wig. <laughs> so there's always answers to all these problems. But you know, sometimes we get so carried away and all of this technicality. I don't like that, you know, I, but I'm weird. So if you're into all of that, one, two, three, and all of this computer type program and stuff, you develop your relationship with Jesus that fits your personality. But remember, we are different, unique individuals. And Jesus is our Lord and Savior. And God is our Heavenly Father. And we have different relationships with Him. And I'm glad He knows I'm just a country boy raised in a sharecropper's home. And He and I have a different relationship that doesn't get involved in all of this one, two, three, A, B, C. Oh my God, I missed point two. I ruined it now. And oh my God, I expressed doubt. And my confession's ruined now. And oh, what am I gonna do? That stuff is a bunch of baloney. Don't get caught up in that. God knows you, he loves you, and just love him and have a relationship with him where he understands you. Can I hear a little amen? That's about the best I can do. <laughs> he knew the hour had come that he should depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, that's another point. It's over. Supper's ended. That's the thing that I marked in my Bible. The devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus knowing, there's that word again, the Father had given all things into his hands, and he had come from God and was going to God. He rose from the supper, he got up, it's another point. And he laid aside his garments, that's another point. And he took a towel. That's another point, and he girded himself, and that's the conclusion of my sermon there. But after that, he poured water into a basin, began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel with which he had girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, what am I doing? You do not understand now, but you will know after this. Now, in the group that I grew up with, foot washing was one of the ordinances of the church. And usually when I grew up, every New Year's Eve, we would meet and we would have communion and we would have foot washing service. And uh, I got into a foot washing service over in Romania, Egypt, and uh, Mike and I had a great time. It was a long service like Romanians can have. But it was an awesome service, you know, and there's more to foot washing and then they just had dirty feet in those days and they washed their feet. Answer this, why was one of the qualifications for widows to receive supplement from the church is they had to wash the saints' feet. So I'm not getting into that and preaching that, but there's something about washing feet that is phenomenal in the spiritual realm that you can't just say, well, it was just a pattern because they had dirty feet and wore sandals in those days. There's something more to it. And sometimes if you don't think it's humiliating and refreshing, get a small group of women together to wash feet and a small group of men, and you will find that there's something in the spirit realm there that is real and awesome. Anybody here ever wore speed? Yes. 
How many have ever worshipped me? A lot of you worshipped me. All right. So you get an extra brownie point. You worship me. All right. Moving along. So here we are. Over and over again, we said he knew. He knows. I'm glad that he knows, aren't you? That he knows all of the things that I've gone through, all the things that I'm going through. And over and over, he said he knows. And I'm glad he knows. He knows what I have need of. He knows, I, I, I told him, somebody reminded me and texted me that I would give the uh, results of the scan that I had, and I haven't gotten those yet. Well, I, I got them. I went to the uh, imaging and picked them up myself, but I can't read them, so I didn't do much good. But I get antsy in all his waitings, you know, and so I, I'm not being known for waiting. And uh, so uh, I'll let you know, uh, Wednesday I see the doctor and she will read them to me, but they're going to be good. I know that because uh, of the prayers and because of, of the goodness of God. He loves me. He's going to take care of me. He's going to keep me well until I'm in my home, and I, I'm glad that he knows. And suffers ended. I think this is a point I keep emphasizing is, you know, the self-gratification, you know, self-centeredness, saying it's about me, it's ended. You know, it's a different day. The church is going into a different stage now. We've gone through a very horrible election period, and I think you can see, I told you the truth of what was coming, and it's coming faster than I thought, but Kamala and Joe are a couple jokes. I don't think Joe knows where he is half the time. This man is not mentally capable of leading this nation, and it's a shame the American people and the press that we have did not vet these people that we could know who they are. Kamala Harris, when she was running as a candidate, was the first one that dropped out for lack of support. And here she is as a vice president. She's gonna to go to the border. She goes to El Paso and uh, she doesn't go where there's any kind of a real overrun. But it's amazing. We have our citizens living on the street and we have these migrants living in hotels that the government had purchased down, some of them, one of them is in Ahwatukee. And you go downtown and our citizens are living on the street. Guys who came across the river are living in a hotel eating meals that are being served by hotels. It's crazy what's going on. Socialism is right in our hands. It's an antichrist, it's a Marcus movement, Black Lives Matter is not doing anything for black lives. It is a Marxist movement that is seeking to destroy the nuclear family. Our education system is going to hell, and we are sitting here as a church, and we need to get up and recognize that dinner's over. It's dinner's over. It's time we get up and brush ourselves off and realize that there's a war that's going on. You know, we used to sing, I grew up in the church singing, Onward Christian soldiers marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. You know, and we've kind of lost that. Years ago, Dick Bill said, it's time we get off the love boat and get on the battleship. So we're moving into a different phase. All this healthy, wealthy, and wise and all this prosperity teaching, you've heard Benny Hinn apologize, and then you've seen him blackball, and he had to come back and uh, and spin it around. But uh, you know, all this uh, all this prosperity and all this get rich quick, and you know, if you have any illnesses because of sin in your life, all this stuff that we have been spread out is going to fall by the wayside. We're going to face something different. We're going to face a new day. There's some new challenges coming, and it's going to be something to be a Christian because there is persecution that's beginning to rise now. And because of your testimony of knowing and believing in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and God is preparing us in the body for doing something. He's been filling us with his service. We've had all these wonderful teachings. We're the most taught, prepared people in the United States of America in the body of Christ. We have the greatest teachers. We have CDs. We have TV programs. We have conferences. We have been blessed with so many wonderful teachings. 
Now it's time we put it into practice and the entertainment is over and now it's time we getting ready to propel us into our destiny as the body of Christ in these last days to be the salt of this earth and the city on the hill. Can you say amen? I'm telling you what it's going to set up. God's been setting us up for some of the greatest miracles of your life. He's going to, you're going to see him work and do things. Even in this church right here, we're going to see miracles that are going to begin to take place. Supper has ended. Dinner is over. Dinner is over. It's time we just get up and brush ourselves. Now, you know, when you get our age and you have a lot of baggage that have come your way, one of the great advantages of living so long is the negatives of all of the past failures and the past things that we would like to forget. And this is one of the things the Lord keeps bringing me back to because I don't know if it's just for me or others in this room. Some of us, the ministry's over. It's not like it was. Some of us, relationship, we've lost partners. It's been businesses we've lost partners. We've lost bankruptcies. And when we get ready to minister, one of the first thing the enemy does is begin to haunt you. When you begin to go on with the next phase of your life, you feel guilty. It's like you're betraying someone else. But we need to realize dinner's over. We need to get up, brush off the crumbs, and say, I'm pronouncing a benediction on all of my past. I'm believing the Lord only has forgiven me, but he's forgotten and I'm going for as a person that's been set free by the blood and by the power of Jesus Christ. And I'm looking for the next chapter of my life. Come on, let's praise him because he forgives and he forgets. Amen. Now we did this last week and ended, but I just, I like to just do some of these things. I'm not, you know, uh, the Lord loves us to be childlike. Too bad that some of us are childish. But uh, you don't like that. But why don't you just get up and just brush some stuff off? Some of you just need to brush some stuff off. Just brush it off. Brush it off. You know, I, I have to brush off Valley. I hear all these wonderful things that happen and back at Valley and all of these days. And, you know, and when, when, when anytime I want any recognition to hear me talking about, you know, and people here, I want you to know that I pastored a church bigger than this. I want you to know I was somebody. You know, yesterday I was a big man. That's the theme song of my life is I was a big man yesterday, but boy, you ought to see me now. But, uh, you know, it's time to let all that go. That was then, this is now. What is the Lord going to do now? Thank God for what he's done. Thank God he's forgiven me of a lot of bad stuff, things that I never would happen in my life, but it's time we go forward. Can you say amen? amen. All right, let's sit down. It's finished. Harry Lee, when he taught us in the prayer conference over on Central, he talked about these things. He said, don't nurse it. Many times we keep talking about what happened. What happened? Don't nurse it. Don't rehearse it. Quit talking about it. Quit nursing it. Quit rehearsing it. But reverse it and forget it and move on for the next chapter. So easy to preach, hard to do. That's why I keep saying it. Supper's over. Why don't we just wipe our mouth and just say supper's over. Brush yourself off. Supper's over. Let's go on. Get up. He rose from the surgery. He got up and he laid aside his garment. Lay it aside his garment. Glad I can do this. I'm getting rid of that jacket anyway. <laughs> that came in handy. Betty can't get angry at me now. It's part of his sermon. <laughs> you can't be responsible for what you do under the anointing. He laid it aside. He took it off. There's something I think about the priest. Out of the outer court. The priest had this beautiful dress, blue coats, white beneath, linen beneath, 
had pomegranates on it, had bells on it, tingling everywhere he went. And they written on his forehead, holiness unto the Lord. And these 12 stones, he had the, what was these thing on an human? He had them, you know, with this prophetic anointing and oxygen that was there on his chest. And he was strutting around. You could see him. And he would say, there's the priest. He looked so great. Even when he came into the revelatory um, area of the holy place. See it again. I emphasize this. I think this is a great point. In the outer court, natural illumination, churches, non-spirit churches understand salvation, water baptism. But when you walk in the holy place, the only light is a golden lampstand that represents the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. When you come in to the holy place, the only way you fully understand this part of life if you're a believer is if you rely on the Holy Spirit and get full of the Holy Spirit because the churches, all of them believe in salvation and baptism, the brazen altar, the labor of water. But when you walk into the holy place, it's a different lighting. It's the golden lampstand that reveals to you the life of the Holy Spirit. This has been my ministry for 50 plus years of people that are coming into the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And usually they tell me, since I've been filled with the Holy Spirit, I have a brand new Bible. Because the Holy Spirit illuminates so much that I never understood and never knew here. I had all this preached against. And now I'm beginning to understand this. And then when you get up to the third dimension, and you get up to the Holy Holies just before and beyond that veil is the raw presence of God. And there was neither daylight nor was there the golden campfire. It was the Shekinah glory, which is basically a repetition, I understand. And uh, Dr. Murray would know the Shekinah, I guess, assumes it means glory. Is it correct? So, you know, we say Shekinah glory, and we're just saying glory, glory. But this was the light in the Holies of Holies. And we could not go in there with all of these garments on. All of this brass and gold and purple and majesty and all of this red for redemption and this blue for grace. When you get ready to really get into God, listen, I'm closing. And this is very important. Give me your attention. It never fails. When you get ready to get serious with God, it's a day that we get serious with God. Some of us are getting ready to leave this world by natural means or by the rapture. I believe Betty's waiting for the rapture, and uh, I hope she makes it. I mean, I hope it comes in her lifetime and she does. I mean, I believe the rapture is going to be great. You see, here's what I believe. I believe the death of a Christian is just as exciting as a rapture. Amen. I believe that it's, it's phenomenal what happens. The angels are there to usher us into the presence of the Almighty God. And I'm not going to have eternal life one day. I have eternal life now. I'm going to live forever. So what if I got third stage kidney failure? So what if I got a plugged artery that they can't unplug? So what if I've got cancer? You know, who gives a rip? I'm going to live forever, you know? Um, I know Jesus. And if I, I mean, I, I went so close to death those three times this last year that, you know, uh, just boom, and I could have been gone, and uh, you know, so why? You know, that's exciting. But no, here's the thing is, when you get serious and you come into the end, and you know, and you begin to look at your family, you begin to look, you begin to lay things aside. You can tell when someone gets ready to get close to God, you can lay it. They lay stuff aside. They change. They change. 
I changed. Now, I, you know, uh, all of my life, I've been in church. You know, I never had a cigarette in my mouth. I never had a taste of beer. I just went and did big stuff, you know, but things that I'm so ashamed of that I never dreamed would happen in my life. You go through times of loneliness and hurt and you do stupid stuff. Anybody here would do stupid stuff beside me? Am I the only stupid one here? Aren't you glad God loves stupid people? Aren't you glad God loves us and he knows our heart? Aren't you, don't you feel so bad you made it down and you failed it? I can't believe because all of my life has been dedicated to him. But there's stages through my life when I want to get closer to him. And my conversation changes. I don't laugh at the funny stories I used to laugh. I don't hang with some of the people I used to hang with. Because you lay it aside. And I keep saying this over and over again. I don't mean to be ugly to you and I don't know who your friends are. But some of you need to let go of some of your friends. You need to lay it aside. You don't need to hear all that negative stuff. You don't need to hear all that worldly stuff. It's not funny where they were this past weekend and how many women they were with and how many parties they attended. You don't have time for that stuff when you're going to go on with the Lord. It's a new dimension. So here's what I've been trying to tell you. He knows. Aren't you glad he knows? Amen. He knows. Lord, I'm so glad you know. Dinner's in. How many of you can say it's ended for me? I'm ready to wipe my mouth. I want to see God do something different. I want to see Him doing something more. How many of you believe that we're going to see Him do something more that we're going to have to do more? Then it's over. Get up from supper. Lay aside these garments. Put off the weights that so easily beset us. The finals will be over pretty soon. I won't have to worry about basketball. How <laughs> <laughs> do you believe the war? That's an old lady, one year old guy who's been preaching over 50 years, watching a few basketball games. Still loves me. I know he does. He watches it with me. He's a son's fan. God is so don't you love him this morning? Why don't we just tell him again? How many times have we been in church? Some of us are early memories for in church. Why don't we just put our arms out? We talked about adoring him. I just wonder if we really adore him. Can you just adore him? Just look up and imagine just looking in the face of our Lord and just love him again this morning before we go. Lord, been so good to me. I could have been born in a Muslim home. I could have been born in a home of Confucius, all kind of different religion. I was born in a real poverty shack. But 
I had a mom that loved you. My earliest memories always have been about you. I love you, Jesus. I love you. I've always loved you all of my life, and I love you today. You mean the world to me. You mean the world to me. We get old and our bodies are not as youthful as they used to be. Just to know you're there with us. Just to know you love us and you care for us. Ones of us that are young and have a whole life ahead of us. We give our life to you. Young people in this service this morning that are giving their life to you like I did when I was young. They dropped everything. They laid stuff aside. Stuff of wealth and stuff of other dreams. And their dream is of you and your anointing and your blessings and fulfilling your will and your desire in your life. I want you to know we are a room full of people that love you this morning and honor you. I want to hurry before we go. We can just bow our heads and just. Close your eyes. I wonder if there's one here that is just say, Pastor, I just need, I need special prayer. If you just pray a pastoral prayer over me real quick, I would appreciate it. Are you here in this room? Would you just, would you lift your hand? Would you look me in your eye? Would your eyes be a point of contact? I can just pray with you. Lord, for my sister, I just bless her today. You know what she's believing you for? You see the sorrow in her heart. You know the burden. Touch her and lift that burden today in Jesus' name. And my brother over here, the Lord is getting acquainted with this gentleman, and I so love him and appreciate his life. I just pray and give him direction that you just have every need he has. In Jesus' name, here at the front. Here at the front. And my sister, Lord, has some health issues and other challenges. Relationships, would you help her today? Would you help her today? For these here, Lord, for my sister here, and my brother here, and this young man here, Lord, I just pray a prayer for him today. I just bless him. I know God, you care for him. I know you're ministering and you're healing and watching over them. And I just thank you for it. What a privilege to lay my hands on him today. Anna here at the front, Lord, you know what Anna goes through. You know the blessings and you know the challenges. Thank you for your strength on her. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. Can we all just lift our hands and just say, we just love you. We just thank you for strength from day to day. Thank you for all of your blessings and all of your goodness. We love you. Would you stand with me and let's conclude with a song. Thank <laughs> you.